Hello and welcome to the Circular Metabolism Podcast. This podcast is hosted by the Chair of Circular Economy and Urban Metabolism held by Aristide Tenasiadis and Stefan Kampermann at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. In this podcast, we talk with researchers, policymakers and different practitioners to unravel the complex aspects of what makes urban metabolism and economies more circular. Bonjour et bienvenue au podcast Circular Métabolisme. Ce podcast est produit par la chaire en économie circulaire et métabolisme urbain de l'Université Libre de Bruxelles, qui est tenue par Aristide Athanasiadis et Stéphane Kempelman. Dans ce podcast, nous discutons avec des chercheurs, des administrations et des praticiens pour éclaircir les différents aspects qui rendent l'économie et le métabolisme de nos villes plus circulaires. On this episode of the Circular Metabolism podcast, we're very excited to catch up with David Waxmuth during the conference Brussels Ecosystem. David is the Canada Research Chair in Urban Governance at McGill University, where he is also an assistant professor in the School of Urban Planning and an associate member in the Department of Geography. He is an urban political economist whose research interests include city and regional governance, urban sustainability, housing policy, social theory, and the politics of the urban public space. In 2012, David wrote an influential paper in the urban metabolism realm entitled Three Ecologies, Urban Metabolism and the Society-Nature Opposition. During this episode, we discuss how the urban metabolism metaphor was used over the years and how it is not necessarily a fleshed out method, but a working metaphor to describe the relationships between urban areas and their environments. We take a closer look at how urban political ecology helps us understand what happens when flows enter and exit cities and who benefits from them. For instance, in the case of water supply, you take a river and follow it to understand who uses it and how. In the case of New York City, it historically covered its water needs through the Hudson River. And in order to secure its supply, it ended up buying all upstream lands and shutting off all polluting industries. We can imagine that while this was possible some centuries ago, today with the globalization of our supply chains, this is unthinkable, but puts forward a number of governance questions between cities and their hinterlands, which are not yet in place. In the future, urban metabolism will have to focus on the interfaces and boundaries between urban areas and their hinterland, as well as their transitions and transformations. It will have to integrate the quantitative part of industrial ecology and the political focus of urban political ecology. Enjoy this episode and don't forget to visit our website circularmetabolism.com to find all of our productions and activities. Also, make sure to subscribe to your favorite app, including YouTube, iTunes, Spotify and Stitcher to avoid missing any new episodes. Finally, leave us a comment or a review to help us improve our podcast. David, it's nice to meet you uh, here in Brussels. Uh, we're now in the Brussels Ecosystems Conference. You gave your, your great talk about kind of the history of the metabol urban metabolism, the concept, and kind of the three uh, tenets of it. Uh, historically, uh, you mentioned uh, human ecology uh, or social ecology and then industrial ecology and political ecology. Um, And now we're trying to figure out a bit the, the mix of them and what does what. Uh, you, you mentioned this, you know, how each of these uh, have considered the participant and consider nature and city. Uh, could you say, perhaps in your mind, what's kind of the future of this interrelationship? Uh, we kind of see human ecology dying off. Uh, but perhaps there is urban ecology coming in, but how do you see this metaphor or how do you use urban metabolism in your work in general? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, m for me, urban metabolism is just this very, very fruitful and helpful metaphor for thinking about how humans and the natural world relate in cities. And what, the thing that got me interested in it is realizing how much has changed over time, right? So if, if we go back 100 years to the Chicago School of Sociology, 
they're talking about urban metabolism, but they're not considering the natural world at all. For them, it's, a, it's really a metaphor. They say, we see a biological system and it works in a certain way. Can we apply that to a human system, like a neighborhood or a city? And um, 50 years later, we see the same metaphor being asked to do very different work with industrial ecologists, where for them, they're thinking of cities as the kind of factories for converting the natural world into society. And so they're understanding urban metabolism as this process of taking nature, turning it into cities, turning it into human environments, and then kind of producing waste at the other end. Um, so it's the, you know, the same idea, metabolism, the ch change, transformation, applying it to cities, but with very, very different ideas of who's involved, of w how the natural world and the human world relate to each other. And then we see the same thing when we take it into the present, where political ecologists, urban ecologists, urban political ecologists, are trying to understand how nature and society kind of intermix and are kind of transformed together in the context of cities with a lot more attention now to politics, so who wins, who loses, kind of uneven distributions. But again, that there's a, so there are some kind of through lines where we see this consistent metaphor deployed, but also the way that that metaphor changes, I think tells us a lot about our changing relationship with the natural world. And, and do you think because uh, there, ha there has been a lot of criticism about urban metabolism as being a sterile metaphor or, or not being uh, complex enough or being too simplistic. Do, do you think that, I mean, y you said that it's evolving, the, the, the use of, its, of this metaphor is evolving, but do, do you reckon that it's sufficient or do we need more tools to, to you know, um, integrate all of this complexity and how do we integrate all of this complexity because let's say industrial ecology is engineers <laughs> more the uh, this type of word and then urban political ecology is more geographists or urban scientists and you know both use it in a different way but is there something more that we can use in order to make them work together well one of the reasons why i stress that urban metabolism is a metaphor is because I think it's most helpful if we treat it that uh, as that, which is to say, it's not a system, it's not a, a, a fleshed out method. It's, it's something that kind of provokes us and can hopefully kind of guide our thinking in productive directions. So for me, that means a real focus on transformation, on change. Those are, you know, those are kind of positive things to be thinking about, but also a real focus on kind of interfaces and boundaries. And you know, we'll, that kind of system thinking will ask us where the system ends, what's on the other side of that. And I think what we see historically is that metabolism is a, a very helpful metaphor for kind of pushing thinking about cities to kind of interrogate its own idea of boundaries and what lies beyond those boundaries. So in that sense, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want to get too kind of closed into um, a, you know, a very kind of narrow idea of metabolism studies. We're going to measure all the inputs and measure all the outputs, but rather treat as a kind of invitation to be thinking about how urban systems change. And I think we've, we've discussed this about how also the actors are present or, mm -hmm. or absent in this story. And uh, I think it's really urban political ecology that succeeds most into at least putting actors inside of the system. Right. And saying, you know, the flows are actually, um, you know, circulated by people. Mm -hmm. uh, the infrastructures are also networks and these are companies or people who are behind all of this. And uh, could, could you tell us how urban political ecology could help us not only just circulate flows, but also pinpoint perhaps, you know, the pressure points, which could be pressure actors or pressure, you know, infrastructures or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a really, uh, you know, a helpful way to think about this would be if we think about a really classic industrial ecology metabolism study where it says, We've got a city and we understand, we try to kind of catalog all the different resources that are necessary to build that city and to keep it running. And then we look at the outputs. We see the waste products as well as the kind of positive outputs, the society that we get in the city. And um, you know, that can be a very insightful way to understand how cities kind of relate in environmental terms to the non-city, to the natural world outside them. But it tells us very little about once those materials enter the city, in, in, in whose particular benefits are they transformed and built and constructed? And so, you know, one easy way to think about this is that, you know, when we think about how nature enters cities, 
Um, we, there are a bunch of good ways it does. We have parks, um, we have you know, kind of natural amenities that are very productive. We also have all the kind of products of society, you know, the buildings that are built out of natural materials, all the good stuff. But we also have a lot of bads. We have pollution and we have um, kind of people who don't, they don't get to go to the park. Instead, they are, you know, they're dealing with polluted water um, with, that they would rely on for, for drinking water. So those kinds of questions about once nature arrives in the city, who has access to it in its different forms? Those are kind of the kinds of questions that urban political ecology asks. And so I think, you know, kind of really helps us to take the city and kind of open it up, not just as the, the site for the transformation of nature, but rather as a kind of, you know, itself a kind of a system with a lot of inequality and kind of different actors able to benefit in different ways and try to really understand that. In terms of, um like if you, if you want to follow through on that idea and, and do a study or, yeah. or do this analysis in terms of methods or previous collaborations, like do you have in mind uh, some, some, some examples uh, yeah. of where this has been done previously and uh, produced interesting results? Yeah, so I would say that a lot, particularly in the early days of urban political ecology in the kind of late 1990s and early 2000s, something that you see a lot of is you take a city that has a river in it and you kind of follow that river in a political and kind of social way. So, you know, you understand that the river has various functions that it performs for the city, but you, you look at the different actors who, what they do with that river, and then also how that river is kind of used politically. So, you know, what, when city council debates, are we going to, we're going to develop the waterfront, mm -hmm. you know, what kinds of plans do they consider there? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of like an ethnographic method, um, is what I, mean, I think is quite the common. the actual flow of the water? I mean, do you have the data, I suppose, for... You what could, yeah. And, uh, I think that generally speaking, urban political ecologists, yeah. it's, it's, they've mostly been um, kind of, you know, hum, uh, humanist, you know, people coming from the humanities and the yeah, social yeah. sciences, where they're paying a little less attention to the kind of the, the materials per yeah. se, yeah. and more about the kind of social life of those materials. Yeah. But certainly I think that, the, you know, the kind of frontier would be to try to integrate these things. So you, you understand the river in its kind of very clear, directly material terms. As physical well. uh, dimensions. Yeah. Exactly, as well as in the kind of political dimensions. But, uh, do you, has that been done somewhere? Like, you know, this sort of integration? Yeah, well, is I, this I, still the frontier? I think it's still the frontier mm -hmm. to a large extent, but I think that there have, you know, there have been some, some pretty interesting attempts to push on that. I mean, the work of Eric Swingadow on water, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's very directly tried to particularly connect the, 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 kind of the infrastructures that mm. we build to, to channel water, to control water, to drink water, to you know, uh, clean water with mm. social power and, so, and kind of power relations. And um, yeah. so you know, I think that's a pretty interesting way forward. Okay, also like maybe related to that is, um, I have the impression if you say like, you know, there's nature coming into the city, it's looking at the urban perspective, like the, the urban metabolism pretty much from the perspective of the urbanites. Yeah. Like, you know, it's us looking around and uh, like asking where the stuff comes from. And then we say it com comes from nature. But like maybe you could also look about the urban metabolism from the, the, the perspective of the countryside, of the actual producers of, of, of resources that we use. And I was just wondering uh, in terms of uh, governance mechanisms, like is there is there innovation? So is there like, you know, innovative thinking about how this governance between uh, these two these two spheres could be, uh, you know, maybe organized more efficiently or, or like more, more, uh, more equally? Uh right. Yeah, well, I think actually a very interesting historical example of this is in New York City. Um, New York City is on a river, the Hudson River, and um, historically it got its water from that river. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that happened as New York City was growing, not the city itself, but the hinterland, the, up, the area upriver, was also growing and industrializing. And the result was that New York's water source was becoming polluted. Mm -hmm. And this was an issue that lay outside of New York City's jurisdiction, right? This was kind of a, a few hundred kilometers up the river, but it very clearly affected what was happening in the city. And there wasn't really a governance model for dealing with that at the time. So the solution that New York City um, adopted was just to go upriver and buy all the land. So the, the city of New York just purchased it's all the cold. land. Yeah, exactly. And then they shut down all the factories. So they were able to preserve um, that, that water source. Now that worked for New York City, but and that, because at that time it was also su sufficiently close to be able to go there and buy it. Exactly. It's now in, in, uh, in China. Like, I don't right, know. yeah, we're, we're, you know, where cities get their, their, yeah. their electricity from, their oil, their water, these could be very, very distant. So mm. I think it's, you know, for me personally, thinking about these connections between what happens in cities and the kind of material preconditions for, for life in cities 
really draws attention to the fact that we just actually don't have these governance mechanisms um, kind of adequately in place. Um, and, or, and where we do, we see that it's quite uneven. You know, some, yeah. some areas have pretty good collaboration, at least at a regional scale. Others, you look at the United States, that's basically a four-letter word. You don't see any of that. Um, and it's a real challenge, I think. Do, do you see like interesting experimentations with this? with this kind of uh, mechanisms or is it still in theory like uh I mean I think that if you look you know there there's there's scholarship that is trying to you know that is trying to draw our attention to mm -hmm. these issues and mm -hmm. you know I think that there are some of the people who would use the idea of metabolism to to kind of to try to make something visible um, mm -hmm. that's not so visible I think as far as kind of good like models on the ground um, you know I think there have there we, there's a, there's a long history to particularly kind of attempts to um, uh, kind of regional restructuring attempts to uh, look at um, energy. And um, you know, in terms of regional planning. Uh, exactly, regional planning, yeah. So, th so I think that we've, you know, there's, there's certainly a history of that. From my perspective, the challenge is not that we don't have some good examples of how that works, but about what would let some of these kind of relatively exceptional examples become more widespread. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, I work in North America and, you know, the Tennessee Valley Authority mm -hmm. that for, uh, Roosevelt um, created um, is this amazing model for regional energy um, in a lot of respects, and but and it's the not water dams and the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, um, and uh, but yeah, so they, they, with some infrastructure, but also governance, um, mm -hmm. and but you know the challenge is not so, is you know we can learn from that, but then we want to say can it be done? Can it be done? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think we've got less to say about that. Okay. Yeah, this is, was, I'm really you know you're talking about this frontier and this use of data and uh, and kind of ideas and kind of governance and. I think I, I think it was you that during the presentation said, "What we can do is understand as much as we want the system, but you know there is political will and political decisions that yeah. actually change everything." Yeah. And I'm really trying to figure out: Is there, of course, we scientists could go out there, collaborate with, you know, NGOs and uh, grassroots, and try to infiltrate uh, administrations and have you know, a policy, science, practice, interface, and all of this. But at the end of the day, it's always the political sphere that decides, right? Yeah. So what do we do? How do we, is it a language barrier? Or, you know, once we have this great model that really pinpoints all of the challenges of a, the metabolism of a city with a global hinterland, let's yeah. say, and we expose some choices, you can do that. And that's the, these are the consequences of your choice, and you can do that. And these are the consequences of the choice. That doesn't, you know, a logical choice is not always taken by sure. politicians, right? How can we? Do, do you have any ideas of how do we go the extra mile? Yeah. yeah. It's also about this discussion about policy evidence now, like this exactly. evidence-based policy. Like yeah. you know, there's a kind of thinking now at the European Commission that w once you have the evidence out, people will act upon it. Right, that's not But, but nobody <laughs> ever saw the, the, the evidence base for urban sprawl or how this is good, you know, that's it's right. still happening. You know? yeah. and so so uh, no, uh, how, how to penetrate the decision-making uh, process other than just uh, showing up with the data and, uh, you know, engage with them a bit more. Uh, well, well, you know, this is, uh, this is one of the reasons why I think actually metaphors can be so powerful, yeah. right? Um, because, you know, because you're right, there's, there's, there's no question that it's not simply there's not a threshold of evidence, and if we hit that threshold, <laughs> now the policies all change, right? Yeah. Um, instead, what happens is that political actors mobilize over issues that are important to them, and they come with different capacities, and it's you know, and then we find out what happens. Um, and so I'm think so you know, for example, the idea of the circular economy, um, yeah. or you know, um, I think that that is that that's a metaphor that is I think intuitive and powerful. You know, you've got a linear metabolism. You, versus a circular one, you can kind of understand that and that can help with communication. One example from Canada where I'm based that I find very inspiring is that there's been a lot of um, public debate about pipeline development for, in the oil sector, right? Canada's a real oil-based economy right now. And, um, you know, there's real physical infrastructure necessary to exploit the oil resources in Canada. Um, and it's located in very, um, like, up, generally speaking, in the north of the country, which doesn't have a lot of cities. It has a large indigenous population, but not, um, you know, n but, but, f but a very small amount of the whole country's population is located there. So it's a very kind of geographically distant issue, but it's actually central to the whole country's economy, including to the urban economy. Yeah, the city, right? of the urban yeah, and what we've seen in the last several years is an increasing recognition of the kind of common interests of, you know, basically environmentalists living in cities 
and indigenous people whose way of life is being threatened by these pipeline developments. And you're seeing actual human beings kind of moving across that interface where pipeline protests at these different locations are having people from the cities come and show up. Indigenous groups are coming from, um, from these territories to the cities to you know, lend their voice. And you know, that that's, that's kind of direct you know, political mobilization. But it's, I think it's, it's one where, it's, to me, it's quite clear that the, the presence of the kind of imagination of the, the kind of the hinterland and the cities being actually intimately it's connected. understanding the system connection. Yeah, that, is, that actually is productive in political terms. And mm -hmm. I think you know, it's a fight we're still fighting. I don't know, yeah. you know what the outcome will be, but those are the kinds of things that give me hope. And again, it's why I think the, the importance of imaginaries of, of, of these kind of ways that we have of kind of boiling down very complex social situations into intuitive terms are so important. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, you know, Canada is, Canada, Australia, I guess, are, are two countries where you can have this type of, you know, production versus consumption yeah. kind of discussion. Yeah. Imagine you go to the well. port of Antwerp and that's it. That's yeah, the yeah, other. that's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you see the big ships. And <laughs> but but yeah. that's the issue, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the, the whole global slash local, global yeah. challenges, yeah. wicked problems that we have is how me from Brussels can communicate with a person, I don't know, in Southeast Asia, uh, that they are taking all of the pollution that we're yeah. kind of, you know, pushing towards their throats. So, you know, for me, that's, and you talked about it, you know, it's this multi-level layered uh, governance, but I still don't, I mean, yeah, it's... Uh, well, I just it's don't really think we, we don't have the governance tools to do it, right? I mean, I think that yeah. that's just the reality. There, no, but, no. but there are, you know, there are also a big trend that I think we're all aware of in urban environmental governance is the interlocal networks where cities are trying to cooperate kind of horizontally. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, there, it's one of the things that I'm doing some research on right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, that you, even with these global networks, the actual kind of extent of, of practical collaboration in these networks can be more limited. But it's still, these are, you know, these are efforts to try to kind of build some new governance geographies that do a better job of kind of mapping onto the yeah. kind of real scale of environmental issues. It's 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 bypassing the nation state, no? As, so a, as a forum, sometimes, uh, many yeah. of these things uh, yeah. would be discussed and legislation would be made, and it's more a conversation between metropolitan areas. Of how do you deal with it? How you know? How it's bypassing the nation state somewhat, but it's also in some cases an. an another venue for kind of exerting pressure on nation states, right? That, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, because they, and you know, one of the things that I've argued in some of my work is that we have this new idea of cities as these kind of leading protagonists on environmental issues, particularly in climate policy. And there's a lot of wishful thinking there because cities just don't control a lot of the policy levers that are consequential. You know, mm -hmm. cities have, tend to have control over land use and transportation to some extent, mm -hmm. which are big drivers of, of greenhouse gas emissions, but they have usually almost nothing to say about energy policy, about um, industrial policy in general. And that, um, so c cities on their own can, can only do a fairly limited amount. Um, but if they work together, they can do a little bit more, but also importantly, they can kind of build a constituency where that national governments have to take, um, you know, have to kind of take notice of, and okay. hopefully the, their own national policy gets shifted in a positive direction. So is it a matter of, 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 of trying to work together in order to weigh more on the national policies or is it a matter of like trying to maybe get some more competences back to metropolitan areas and away from the nation state? I mean, there's two... Uh, yeah, they, I mean, I think that there, it's contextual, you know, the, in Canada, there's a lot of debate about trying to strengthen the constitutional or the kind of jurisdictional powers of cities directly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, and I think that that's a debate that happens in, in, in you know, it's happening all over, over the yeah. world. But, you know, that there cities are never going to get industrial policy competencies, right? They're never going to, like, you know, again, to, to use the example of the oil economy mm -hmm. in Canada, where I'm from, you know, that's, the national government is always going to be in charge of that policy, in particular because the oil is not located in cities, right? That they're, they're yeah, yeah, yeah. so that local jurisdictions are... And also, in theory, the nation state is supposed to look at the, the collective interest of the exactly. whole territory, yeah. like including the rural territory. So there yeah. might be, like, in terms of a system system perspective there might even be a case for uh, not giving it power to the city I think that's right it's my egoistic and uh, but I think the real key is that that all mm. these things are happening mm. kind of simultaneously that you know that if like the some of the like I think the positive ways forward are not going to be exclusively because cities are empowered or because they do more conversation with each other or because mm. you know they're they are able to lobby national governments more it's going to be the fact that all of these things if they all, if they reflect kind of, a, you know, a building kind of popular mm -hmm. pressure in a positive direction, that's wh where we're going to get.
because we're in the end we are all in the same boat uh, as a civilization no i mean <laughs> yeah although uh, although no, it, it's, it, 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 it's true although it, you know i think it does it, that it highlights some of the difficulties right because mm -hmm. you know this is true it, it this is a, a, true at many scales if you look at a given city environmental problems are very unevenly distributed as well as environmental amenities um if you look at a region that continues to be the case at the nation, at the whole world. So at every one of these scales, there are these coordination problems. Mm -hmm. And that the, you know, at the global scale, I think is where we know, where we have a, a quite a good understanding of, 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 of how s these kind of benefits and costs are being distributed, but just but the, the largest gap clearly in terms of the actual governance to, to address them. Yeah, it's more of a, let's say, slum uh, confederation that should you know, counterbalance the, the top one percent right. or ten ten percent you know something like this like a well a bottom up a, a bottom up initiative from the the people who are more most affected right from and, the bad so and you do the see some you know they're 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 the same kind of interlocal networking you see that informal settlement you know um some of the movements around informal settlements are also doing their own networking internationally and i think that's a really positive development because there are you know these the kind of environmental issues to get mobilized around aren't simply just the ones that the C40 and 100 resilient cities that the elite networks are going to mobilize around. And so I think it's important that there's pressure building from below at multi many, many different sites at once. Well, it's about pressure, but it's also like developing the actual experimentations that, uh, that could lead up to new solutions. No, I mean, I have the impression that the, like if the discussion only stays at national or, or like, uh, let's say in, 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 in Brussels, we have a lot of European Union discussions that all stays very abstract yeah. and they never like develop sufficiently concrete uh, approaches that it can actually be implemented somewhere, you know, and that, that I think has to come from territories that are, you know, at the scale of, you know, making experimentation actually. Go you know, I think that there's actually, this is a ca case where maybe you guys can tell me what you think that there, um, I think that the difference between what, what this looks like in the EU compared to some other places can be quite strong because my, you know, I think that in a lot of the locations that I'm familiar with, there, we are so far from the frontier of just acting on what everybody who with you know who's well informed knows to be the case the, the gap between even just kind of you know with, without with no with no experiments with no new knowledge being generated let's simply, not start a nuclear war yeah exactly yeah <laughs> just just basic facts yeah. right yeah. that the, 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 the gap between what the basic facts would tell us to do and what is happening mm. is already profound mm -hmm. and then so the the you know i i, I guess that means that f from my perspective i sp tend to think to kind of spend my time thinking about even just mobilizing on basic facts. So mm -hmm. the question of kind of generating new knowledge and new experimentation. I mean, I'm a, I'm an academic. I wanna, I wanna do research. But that, uh, that for so many of the important issues, it's, it's it, the, to me the important questions are just kind of truly just directly political ones about how you know interests get mobilized and how yeah, we okay, can kind of win those fights. On it. I mean, there's, I mean, sometimes it's easier to raise awareness and create, like you know. Uh, it, it, like in Brussels, we had this example of a, of a pedestrian area that yeah. everybody uh, wants to have yeah. because it's kind of a common sense thing not to be run over by a car. You know, like it's, yeah. a, it's a basic fact that nobody wants to die out of like the, the, the uh, uh, carbon monoxide that comes out of the car. Everybody wants to get rid of the cars. So the, the, uh, the, the awareness raising must be done. And it created a momentum in which after say, okay, you know, let's just do it. Yeah. But then the there wasn't experimentation there wasn't uh, uh, much thought about how to Im actually implement the right. pedestrian zone yeah. so the planning was so bad that in the end the result might be even worse than yeah it undermined before. it undermined so, the original energy you know yeah. it's, it's uh, i think it has to be about awareness raising but also like you know so how to act up on it you know how yeah. to how to do it afterwards you know uh, because uh yeah as i say in italy the the the, the hell is the way to hell is good intentions. Or something right, like the road to hell is paved yeah. with good yeah, intentions. Yeah, the road to hell is good, good intentions. Yeah, I think. Right. Yeah, there, there's some. I think there's some reality <laughs> to that. Um, and certainly, I think that we're. You know, it, I, I. One of the things I. I think a lot about is local climate policy, mm. and you know that there is. You know, these are. This is an area where. Um, where I think there are. Where there. There's some. You know, we we know a lot about what cities could be doing better. Um, and but there also are, are also you know there's some some big things that we don't know so much about you know in, in the context of sea level rise like what are the appropriate you know ways for cities to prepare for that I think you know there's still we, we need we need the experimentation to you know get some examples yeah, yeah, and yeah. also see how Inspire they also people. exactly it's possible right. to do it you know yeah we're almost reaching the end uh, I, have, I have a little question about uh, uh, French uh, philosophy yeah you mentioned Emile Durkheim like sociologists uh, uh, 
when you type uh, in Google uh, the three ecologies, yes, you end up in your article. Yeah, but also you end up with Guattari. W but yeah. also, mm -hmm. like if you type it in French, yeah, you, you end up with uh, Felix Guattari in yeah. the three ecologies of him. Yeah, like do you get a lot of email uh, for? <laughs> <laughs> oh. and, and, and and like you know, obviously the three like afterwards uh, like. Uh, I was thinking, like you know, when I first saw your article, I was like, "Is that a literature reference or not?" Yeah. And then I looked at the references; like it doesn't really appear there. Yeah. And then it's not the same ecologies because in Guatemala right. you have the also the mental ecology. That's right. And like putting in question like who we are as, as humans and our spirituality. So how how do you relate to that? Uh, well, the, the the honest truth is that when I was doing this three ecologies project, the 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 ecology was it was a coincidence in the sense of what I wanted to do was I wanted to trace the use of the term urban metabolism mm -hmm. in social science. And what I found was these kind of three eras. And then I realized that they all, the kind ecology. of the schools are all called ec something ecology. So the natural idea there was that we've got three ecologies, human yeah. ecology, industrial yeah. ecology, and urban political ecology. And then my very next thought was, Guattari's already used that phrase. Yeah. And so then I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'll come up with something else. And then I just had a change of heart and said, you know what, it's, I'm saying something different, it fits, I'm gonna use it. And but yeah, it's it's it's, it's a totally yeah, uh, it's a, it's a coincidence. Uh, okay, but uh, why, what about your mental ecology? Is uh, does it uh, is it not related at all to your work or? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think that there you know there uh, that project in particular is maybe you know I think that you could actually plot out some mental ecologies that correspond with these different eras of social science in the sense of you know that there are a whole set of kind of shared assumptions about who we are, what the city is, you know, where that ends. So I, so I, yeah, I mean, it would be a fundamental layer. Of exactly. Yeah. I think it would be an interesting way to go with that. There's in a lot of ways, like, you know, once you talk about behavior and, uh, I know if you ever are able to convince people to go towards more sobriety and, uh, you know, scale down, uh, consumption and everything, you have to touch also their, their, their perception of themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not something I've done, but I think it, it would be very fruitful. Thanks David. My pleasure. <laughs> Thanks. 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 Thanks.